Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by thanking everybody who's here, who's a, uh, a veteran who served our country in our nation's uniform, first and foremost. Let me thank all of you, those who are continuing to serve for your service. You know, in this country, we have a, a great spirit that says we're not gonna leave anybody behind on the battlefield. Uh, but frankly, I think today we're very challenged because I think the way we've defined our battlefield is over there, when for many of our returning veterans, they're taking their battlefield here back to their homes. And you know, in our country, we have an ethic that if any one of our soldiers or men and women in uniform were caught behind enemy lines or taken prisoner of war, we would put the full might of military power into going in there and setting them free. Every single American knows that if any of them were caught as POWs, we'd be putting yellow ribbons on every tree in America saying we're not gonna stand by until they get home. But right now, we have a new kind of POW, a medical POW, who is imprisoned by their war injuries the signature wound of this war is traumatic brain injury and PTSD. And because these wounds are seen as invisible, in many cases, our response to these wounds is also invisible. We talk a good game in this country, all the great respect to those who are empowered in charge of taking care of our veterans, but frankly, the sense of urgency is missing. I spoke recently to one of my Rhode Island Guard and Reserve members, Kit Parker, two tours in Iraq. He said, Congressman, he showed me a picture of where his convoy was hit with an IED and knocked over. He said, right after it got hit with an IED, we were taking rocket pro propelled grenades and heavy arms fire. He said, whether my guys, he's a medic, were killed then, or five years later, they come down with a dreaded neurological disorder because they had a concussion. Or they end up taking their own lives as a result of suicide. That's a win for the terrorist. There may not be an enemy combatants present when they take their lives or when they end up in our own prison system in record numbers. But make no mistake about it, he said, Congressman, the enemy is present. And we're not seeing it that way. Because if we were, we would be employing that spirit of leaving no soldier behind on the battlefield that we employ if they are held behind, because we do anything to get them. Why aren't we using that same spirit to go get them when they're imprisoned here at homes? They're imprisoned in their mind. They're, they're held behind the enemy lines of stigma. And when this great Congress says, go out and find us the reason for suicides, and all the best and brightest come up with a collection of points they want to make on what they think are the contributing factors to suicide, they mention three things, three words. They said it's behavioral, psychological, and mental health. And this is from the best and brightest we have in America reporting back to Congress on their congressionally mandated suicide report. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It's physiological. It's no different than if they had had one of their limbs blown off like let many of their other colleagues and they were left bleeding to death. And we're leaving them bleeding right now because we're not taking this thing seriously enough. When we say it's psychological, we give the imprimatur there's something that's not fully legitimate about it. We say it's mental health, we're saying there must be something morally deficient about these soldiers, they need this help. When we say it's behavioral, we stigmatize it even more. You know what's killing our soldiers at record rates through suicide? It's stigma. When I grew up, I learned all about my uncle's uh, role as the first president of the United States to give the speech on the moral imperative as a nation that we ought to start including all Americans. He's the first president to speak on national civil rights legislation and to offer it, and he said, gone is those days where we could treat people separate but equal. 
we had the Supreme Court already say separate but equal is unequal. And yet now, we have the whites only water fountain and we have the colored only. And right now that colored only is mental health. If I have a health care concern, do you think I want to go drink water from the morally defective water fountain for mental health? Or do I want to get my health care in the regular health care system? And then we wonder why veterans are feeling stigmatized because when they come in and say, oh, they, oh wait a second, uh, you belong over in that little line over there. I don't know about you, but I faced stigma my whole life with addiction and depression. But believe me, I'm not a, a soldier that's been indoctrinated to be in it, to win it, no matter what. You're a winner. You're on top of it. No one can beat you. You're the best. If I've got that culture, I'll be even more stigmatized by my mental illness. You know, I've grown up in an environment where my family's been leading the charge in destigmatization. They did it with the Special Olympics, did it with the Civil Rights Bill, all these things, and yet I still feel stigmatized by my mental illness. Imagine how a soldier feels who doesn't have the culture that my family has that it's acceptance, it's okay, this is part of who you are. We look at our strengths, not our weaknesses. That's not the attitude in America. We label people weak if they have an injury of their war that's in their brain. We say it's their fault they can't pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get on with life. And then why do you think it's going to be so hard for us to get them to self-identify? I wonder. You know, we're talking all about, oh, we need to train up all these new mental health providers. Well, you know what? Why are we training them up when two, the statistics show today two-thirds of those who have good benefits don't use them because they're so stigmatized by them? Maybe we ought to start changing the nomenclature, our attitude. Maybe we started training up our existing health care providers to also be mental health providers, because I guess what? I thought somewhere along the way they take care of the whole person. They don't just say, oh, wait a second, we got you from the neck down over here, and we got you from the neck up over here. Wait a second. I thought this was supposed to be holistic care. Then why aren't we doing the holistic care in the real health system, the physical health system? You know, not call it the mental health. Say it's all physical. You'll find all of our problems go away, I think. Because then it's now, it's, hey, listen, hey, I got my bell rung too many times. I got depression. Guess what? I'm self-medicating. God bless you. You know what? I have that same thing. And also, and this or that, I got this uh, herniated disc, and I got this prosthetic device. And, you know, it'll all be interchangeable. No one will have any preoccupation about saying, you know, they've got symptoms of TBI and PTSD because now it'll be just like everything else. Unless we don't change the current system that bifurcates everybody and says, you're over here and you're okay to have your wound. So I think we're not going to address what we need to address in terms of outreach and getting mental health services to those who need it. If they don't understand, it's physiological. I don't, first of all, they're not even attributing TBI as a contributing factor for suicide. And what? And then they say, oh, that PTSD, oh, that's... What do you, is that psychological? No, that's physiological. When are we going to get DOD to tell you that? When you've got cortisol pumping through your brain for such a long, protracted period of time because you're never sure when that bomb is going to hit you, even if you're in the green zone and you know you're not safe because you're on the front line just as much as anybody else because a mortar could come down or they could drive across the outside the green zone and get hit by an IED, guess what? That cortisol changes the physiological, physiological impact of the brain circuitry. It's, it's as much of a combat wound as anything else. It's a combat wound that occurred in the field of battle. Just as if someone had, had a limb blown off. They had their brain altered because of their service. That's a combat wound. When are we going to get a Purple Heart? for those who have been injured serving their country, but because their injury occurs in the brain. Maybe once we start reimbursing for things that x-ray not just the skull, but the brain as well. Maybe once we start 
employing latest in imaging technology that will help our veterans better know what the, how their uh, brains work and, and go through with them all the latest in imaging technology, which is revolutionary. Let's get them the best. Because you know what? That's, they are the best. They're our number one. If anyone in this town is fighting over money, should think about anything, they should say, well, there's one group that's at the front of the line. I don't care if I'm a Democrat or a Republican. The American veteran is number one. That's one special interest that there shouldn't be any disagreement about here in Washington. Everybody will accept that's one special interest we should have. And let's get in it to win it and go in there and save them from being held behind uh, enemy lines just as if they were held by the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Frankly, we don't have to worry about them taking our soldiers hostage. We're doing too good a job of our own, taking our own soldiers hostage. 12, 15 percent incarceration rates amongst Iraq and Afghan war vets. And we think that's just a, oh, that's their own problem individually. Don't you think there's a phenomena here that should be speaking to us that says the indictment isn't on those individuals for ending up in the criminal justice system. The indictment is on us for not addressing their needs earlier than them having to end up in our prison system as a result.